Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. In President Obama's State of the Union speech, he did mention the words climate and climate crisis, but so far, there doesn't seem to be much focus on this in his legislative agenda. The whole climate change crisis, which only a few years ago, we were told throughout the mass media was apocalyptic with a sense of urgency, has more or less disappeared from public discourse. Now, from the view from the South, countries that are going to and are already being affected by climate crisis, this is a question of urgency. Now joining us to talk about all of this is Martin Kaur. He's the executive director of the South Center, which is an intergovernmental think tank set up by developing countries based in Geneva. He's an economist trained in Cambridge and, he's, and at the Science University of Malaysia. Thanks for joining us, Martin. Thank you very much. So, so what's, what's your view on, on the whole issue of, of, of what's going on in terms of climate policy in, in the northern countries? Because it doesn't seem like much. Well, you know, the climate crisis is now already, uh, you know, taking place in many developing countries. Uh, of course, in the north, you have the Sandy Hurricane, you have, uh, you know, all the excessive rainfall in the United Kingdom, but we have storms in the Philippines, we have hurricanes in Central America, we have floods affecting almost almost uh, all of uh, Pakistan year after year. We have in, in many countries in drought in Africa. So uh, it's not something in the future, it's already taking place, it's increasing. We call them extreme weather events. And at the same time, um, the global climate negotiations seem to be stuck. So we have a crisis, a double crisis on our hands, the crisis of increasing climate problems, and at the same time, a crisis of the world struggling to get to grips with how to deal with it. And uh, the emissions are climbing from year to year. And so what, what's causing the paralysis in the negotiations? I think on one hand, we still have climate denialists, especially in the United States, that is preventing uh, some of the big countries from, from taking their own national actions. And secondly, it's the elusive search for a just solution because people are willing to take actions that may also, at least in the short run, uh, be harmful to their economies, or so they think but they do not mind so much taking it if it is part of a global solution in which everybody is pitching in in a, in a fair and uh, you know, adequate manner. And at the moment, we, we are still grappling with how to get to this kind of uh, global uh, solution because uh, in the negotiations that take place at the United Nations, uh, the rich countries seem to be escaping from the obligations that they, they had already agreed to many years ago. And uh, the perception is that they are trying to push more and more of the burden of adjustment to developing countries. Uh, and there are many developing countries who feel that this is not fair and that we, we still have to fight for a solution that is more fair. And the solution that, uh, that we are trying to get is, number one, that the developed countries, especially the ones who have polluted the most in the past and are still polluting the most, uh, agree to take the deepest uh, emission cuts, you know, and to make them into national targets that they, 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 they bind internationally. Uh, and that the efforts of all the developed countries, when you add them up together, uh, will be adequate according to what science tells us. And science is telling us that uh, the developed countries have to cut their emissions by at least 40% between the 1990 level and the year 2020. So if all the efforts of developed countries add up to this collective uh, cut of 40%, then we are on the road to a solution. Well, we're, uh, we're, in, we're in 2013 and, and there's no such thing in sight. Uh, that, those kinds of targets seem uh, completely off, not being discussed in any of the countries that matter, particularly the United States, which is, you know, the world's biggest polluter. Yeah, I think the countries that adhere to the Kyoto Protocol, uh, which, uh, which are getting fewer and fewer, if you add up the commitments that they have made under the Kyoto Protocol, this adds up to only 18% uh, decline, okay, by the year 2020. And here we have not even counted uh, countries like the United States, uh, or Canada, or Russia, 
you know, or uh, uh, many of these countries who, who have opted out of the Kyoto Protocol or Canada, you know. So this is quite dispiriting and we, we need especially uh, the United States to come on board to, to, to take some leadership. The U.S. proposal is that they cut their emissions by something like 6% and that is simply uh, not, not good enough. And secondly, what we need from the developed countries is a commitment to help the developing countries to do their climate actions. I don't think we, 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 we can expect the developing countries to do the same emission cuts, not now at least, as the developed countries because uh, uh, they didn't pollute very much in the past. Uh, they still are relatively low in their emissions uh, in terms of per capita emissions. And at the same time, they are aspiring to, you know, quite a lengthy period of economic and social development. You know, there seems, there seems to be a sense of complacency about all this in the northern countries, that, that the northern countries aren't going to be affected that much. If they, if they are, they can mitigate it. Uh, or they've kind of accepted it's going to happen. I, I can see in New York, Mayor Bloomberg has already started a, a task force to look at how they're going to change the architecture of, of the coastal areas to put them on uh, pillars and things that uh, won't be you know, more flood resistant or flood proof. N there's very little discussion about the issue of actually uh, reducing carbon emissions. They seem to assume there's, that's not going to change and that they don't, don't want to make the basic changes in the economy and the relationships within the economy that it would take to do this. Yeah, but I think this is really being too complacent, which we are going to, we, which we will regret increasingly because uh, at the moment, our temperature in the world is about 0 0.8 degrees centigrade, higher than the pre-industrial level. And it will soon climb to two degrees uh, higher within a few decades and then maybe it will go on to three or four or five degrees if we continue at, 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 at the current rate. But even at 0 0.8, we are already seeing uh, so many drastic effects. Look at all the fires in Australia or Russia. Look at the storms in, uh, in hurricanes in the United States and so on. So very soon, I think we'll come to realize that uh, climate change is very drastically affecting the developed countries as well. And we haven't really even begun to see uh, you know, what it's going to be when it's two degrees, let alone three or four degrees. Well, given this is a matter of, of life and death in a lot of the southern countries, uh, what, what, what are, can they do to force the northern countries to take a position on this? There's not much that we can force, actually. I think it's up to the citizens in the developed countries themselves. The, the developing countries are not in a situation where they can force, except for the developing countries to say that we are willing to take uh, actions also but those actions that we will take will also be costly I mean if we are going to to to, to build the sea walls if we are going to uh, that will help ourselves but also if we are going to reduce our emissions by either having less motor cars or the kind of motor cars that don't pollute if we are going to switch from coal and oil which is cheaper at this moment than renewable energy uh, and if our economic growth of the next 20 to 30 years is going to also generate so much pollution and emissions, unless we are able to have access to the technologies that are non-emitting. So I think what we need to have in the South is a technological revolution that will allow us to have uh, transportation, energy, industry, agriculture that doesn't emit uh, carbon dioxide or doesn't emit so much. But we need that technological revolution to happen. It will not happen by itself because of the cost factor. You know, it's cheaper to go on with the current uh, way of doing things until it's too late. So for us to have access to affordable technology, uh, that is quite costly. And the technology itself is also quite expensive unless we are able to come to some agreement that these technologies are made available cheaply to the developing countries as cheaply as possible. So we need a fund, and we do have a fund. It's called the Green Climate Fund. Luckily, we have set that up under the UNFCCC. That's the UN Convention on Climate Change. The fund has been set up. The board has already met uh, four or five times. 
and they are still struggling on the modalities of how to get the, the money and how to begin to distribute it. So far, it has not distributed any money yet. So these are the beginning days. But there is at least a hopeful sign that uh, the international community has set up a climate fund. And we have uh, also, under the UN Convention, set up a policy committee on how to get technologies uh, available to developing countries. A technology center is also being set up with a network of uh, hubs in order to promote uh, the right kinds of low emitting technologies, but also adaptation technologies. So I think the institutional setting up of things is there, and now we need the political will to make it happen, you know, to make uh, this switch happen to low carbon technologies and to get adaptation uh, going in developing countries. Uh, and somehow we do have to find this political will. So I think what is important is for the citizens in the developed countries to push their governments on two things. One is to take the lead in cutting their own emissions. Otherwise, the rest of the world watching will not feel inspired to do so themselves or they will not know how to do it themselves. Secondly, in the developed countries, keep on developing the technologies that we need and then make those technologies available as cheaply as possible to developing countries. Because we are fighting a world war. This is the third world war. This is a war of humanity as a whole against uh, climate change. So if we put this on a war footing, then it doesn't matter so much whether our big companies are going to make super profits or just average profits. What matters more is to get those technologies into those countries that need it so that they can see that there is an alternative social economic path that does not damage uh, the climate or at least does not damage it to such a catastrophic level. Uh, I think the statistics are there to show that if we don't act in the next 10 years, then it, it's really going to be very late, perhaps even too late. We are already seeing so many events that are taking place. We only have a small window of opportunity to do big things. And if we don't take this window of opportunity, but keep quarreling about who should do what before I do, then uh, I think this is, uh, this is really calamity for the earth and this is catastrophe for humanity. Whether you are living in the United States or whether you are living in Mali or the Philippines, it will be affecting all of us in ways that uh, we may not even know how it will affect us uh, in the future. Right. All right. Thanks for joining us, Martin. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.